So I want to talk about some of the ideas, some of the ideologies about Britain and the world that I see from my vantage point just studying political thinkers and political actors. Some of those ideas, I want to map some of those out. Think about what shape they might take, what might be their fate in the current world. So let me start by saying that one way we might imagine the place of the UK in the world, and one way that has been quite dominant in some people's political thinking in the last 15 to 20 years, has been to think that the UK, in common with other nations, has a kind of mission in the world. And that's a mission to create global democratic progress, to spread liberal ideas, liberal markets, liberal values around the world, sometimes by military force. That's the kind of philosophy represented on the one hand by what we sometimes call neoconservatism and associate with the Bush era, or with something like the Henry Jackson Society, a kind of political think tank advocacy group that is very committed to, uh, as it puts it in its uh, statement of aims, the global promotion of the rule of law, liberal democracy, civil rights, and the market economy. It sees itself as ensuring the development and spread of Western policies of strength and human rights, a kind of militarized, muscular liberalism. And that's, of course, a philosophy that we might have associated in recent years with the Blairite New Labour era, if not with all of the New Labour Party at that time. It's certainly the kind of set of ideas that people reach to when thinking about and justifying military policy in the Middle East after 9-11. And it's a policy, interestingly, that attracted people whose names are now known for their role in Brexit. One of the leading figures in the Henry Jackson Society has been Gisela Stewart, but also Michael Gove. So here's two leading Brexit campaigners who a few years ago were advocating a political position that saw Britain as engaged, outward looking in the world, militarily so, pushing a very clear idea of certain sorts of political values. So we might think that that position has taken a bit of a blow. A blow from Brexit, which surely would seem to be a withdrawal from the world, but also a blow from changes in US politics. We're not quite clear what the foreign policy position is going to be of the new administration in the US, but it certainly seems from some angles to be one that is not concerned with going out in the world and spreading these kinds of Western values by military force. But that kind of view, that belief that the UK should be part of a civilizing mission in the world, that's an old philosophy and it's taken many, many forms and I think we can see it right now adapting and shifting and taking a new form for a post-9-11, post-Iraq war, post-Brexit, post-Trump era. Because some of the people who are committed to that idea of Britain's role in the world thought that the EU hindered it. They thought that the EU was too sclerotic and bureaucratic, too focused on its own internal processes, too narrowly concerned with its own mission, to really be doing the good work of spreading global free markets, global justice as understood by Western powers. Someone like Liam Fox, for example, now our International Trade Secretary, having saved himself from his long period of disgrace, has long been an advocate of what he called, in the name of his charitable stroke political organisation, the Atlantic Bridge. So one way of viewing that idea that the UK should be playing a very particular kind of aggressive role in the world, spreading certain kinds of values, is to see that as involving a very close alignment between the UK and the US, strongly pushing a very particular set of economic, political, and legal kinds of values. So maybe what we might see taking shape within the camp of those committed to Brexit is a kind of new globalism. A new globalism, but one that is rooted in a very particular conception of Anglo-American political, economic, and military interests. It's interesting to note, if you read the blog of Dominic Cummings, the key figure in leading and shaping the Vote Leave campaign, he talks about the arguments backstage in the running of that campaign where he was strongly opposed to the slogan that many of the leading Brexiteers wanted to be the headline for their campaign. And that slogan was Go Global. What was partly shaping their thinking was an idea of getting rid of the EU in order to be ever more open to unrestricted or relatively unregulated free markets, free from some of the restrictions imposed by the legal rights regime of the EU. Cummings saw, perhaps correctly as it turns out, that that slogan would not be a winning one for the Brexit campaign and instead pushed for the 350 million for the NHS, for the Turkish migrants and for votes leave take control. 
But clearly part of the Brexit campaign was not concerned to simply pull up the drawbridge of British life, but in fact to radically open British economic borders, if not the borders, uh, to people. And that kind of idea of a, of a new sort of globalism links to what I think is becoming, or looking like it might emerge as one of the key sets of ideas shaping the way politicians imagine Britain's role in the world now, and that's a kind of commitment to a new idea of the Anglosphere. So some of you may have come across Henrietta Marshall's book, Our Island Story. David Cameron shows it as his favourite book uh, back uh, in, I think, mid-2000s, mid 2006. This is a story of British history written in 1905, republished in 2005, and becoming surprisingly praised by a wide range of political figures. A new version of British history, stressing its civilising mission, its imperial role in the world as one that was, by and large, good. And that book, though it might seem strange to attribute such influence to what's essentially a children's history, has been seen by some uh, scholars as actually quite an important moment, giving Eurosceptics a new way to imagine a global role for Britain outside of the EU. A kind of reworking of its imperial role, but more narrowly focused on the Anglosphere, on what Churchill called the English-speaking peoples of the world. So here the argument is that Britain should now see itself as really primarily tied to the other places that speak English, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and of course the US. And it's something which clearly shapes the thinking of Boris Johnson, who has described Britain's accession to the EU in 73 as a betrayal of Australia and New Zealand. David Davis, another prominent Brexiter, said in 2016, just before the referendum, before the campaign fully kicked off, he said that Brexit would be a great opportunity to renew our strong relationships with Commonwealth and Anglosphere countries. He used the term Anglosphere. We share history, culture and language, he said. We have family ties. We even share similar legal systems. The usual barriers to trade, he claimed, are largely absent. It's time we unshackled ourselves and began to focus policy on trading with the wider world rather than just with Europe, where wider world seemed to mean, in fact, parts of the Commonwealth and particularly the white English-speaking parts of that world. And there has been a strange, <clears throat> for me, very unexpected revival of the campaign for so-called CAMZUC, Canada, Australia, New Zealand and the UK. The conservative historian Andrew Roberts, who some of you may read in the papers or see on TV, is a strong advocate of creating CAMZUC, and he argues, as in their own way to Johnson and Fox, that in the current world what matters is not geographic proximity, because we can transport anything anywhere, but cultural proximity. And therefore it makes logical sense from their point of view to see the UK as really being closer to Australia than it is to France. It's hard for me to see that view really succeeding if it was brought to policy application. Canada under Trudeau is clearly in a very different place to the US under Trump. New Zealand and Australia are, of course, quite understandably looking to China and Southeast Asia. But the rationality of political ideas isn't necessarily a criteria for their being taken up and pursued by <coughs> political figures. So we might even see, however, that Anglosphere idea being pursued against the different policies of Canada, Australia and New Zealand to being what one might call the 51st state option for Britain's role in the international world in the future. It's pretty clear that the current administration will be very keen to sign business deals as quickly as possible to prove that Brexit is working and to fill the gap left when we crash out of the EU single market. And you can see clearly that one way that might be done is by signing up to deals with the US and how the US might be more than welcome, like a smiling lion, to welcome us into its jaws. And then we would find ourselves adapting culturally and economically to US standards and US approaches to economic organisation. And there are some who would definitely welcome that as a new way forward for the UK. Now, so far I've talked about kind of conservative sorts of positions, so let me just say something about what we might see from the left. There is, of course, a strong constituency on the liberal side of politics and parts of the Labour Party that would like to see Brexit, if not repealed, at least end in some kind of renegotiated relationship with the EU. It's not clear to me that people on the left have a strong sense of what that might be beyond some kind of Swiss or Norwegian option. But there are people beginning to realise, I think, that on the left, 
how much they might lose if they are no longer fully associated with the broader socialist and social democratic parties of the EU. Uh, it's underappreciated, I think, how much collaboration and sharing of ideas between socialist parties in the EU has at times contributed to the thinking of British, the British Labour movement and the British Labour Party. Sometimes that's very obvious, as for example in the case of Tony Blair and Gerhard Schroeder, seemingly aligned over the Third Way and in Neue Mitte. But there's actually quite a lot of ongoing discussion and sharing of policy ideas between trade union organisations and parties across Europe. The Labour movement has yet, I think, to fully think about how it can re-establish its bilateral relations with these kinds of organisations, but there's clearly growing groups of people within the Labour movement that would like to do so. However, to go back to what I said earlier about the Henry Jackson Society and Gisela Stewart's and Chris Bryant's role in that, there is a long tradition in the Labour Party of actually looking more to the United States. It's no coincidence that Ed Miliband, for example, spent time at Harvard University, not at the university in Germany or France, that Ed Balls is also a fellow at Harvard now. That interaction between the East Coast of America and labour movements in the UK is very strong and very long-standing and will definitely shape the ways in which some of those people think about their future relations. There is, of course, along in the left, the Labour Party and the left more generally, an anti-EU position. Some of that manifested itself directly as Lexit, so-called left exit in the Brexit campaign. But... Some of it didn't, but we're still hanging around and shaping the ways people were thinking about the EU. There are those who make a case that is not without evidence that the EU has been uh, a vehicle for policies that have been damaging to parts of the global south, for example, and saw that perhaps a change of relationship to the EU as an opportunity to create new kinds of relationships with parts of the developing and non-Western world. There is, of course, also on the left a strong strain of anti-Americanism, and we may well see then Brexit leading to a reformulation of these kinds of positions, whether that's in terms of a certain kind of sympathy to seemingly anti-US forces, which until two months ago was Russia, but now isn't. That might change some minds. But we might see emerging arguments, particularly from the development sector and the charitable sector, for ways in which a post-Brexit UK could reimagine its role uh, as a force for good in developing nations although it's hard to see much broader popular support for that at the current moment. So on the one hand, then, are kind of various versions of central to centre-right to far-right versions of, of a new Anglosphere, left versions of some new kind of perhaps more charitable, seemingly ethical role for the UK uh, in the world. But I think there's a third position, which we have to take seriously, a position that perhaps is shared by some in the political elite, but maybe is shared more broadly by some of those who voted for Brexit. And I'm going to call that position true Brexit, the view of a world in which we are ourselves alone. The political figure, I think, both politician and political thinker, who most cast a shadow over the moment, is, I think, Enoch Powell. And not just because of what Enoch Powell had to say about immigration. At the core of Powell's political philosophy uh, was an idea about this country and its place in the world. Uh, in the 60s, addressing the conservative women of Ealing, Powell diagnosed the national problem this, as this. He said that we suffered from a split personality, a rent between illusion and reality, withdrawing ever and again, like the schizophrenic, into a dream existence peculiar to ourselves. Can you imagine a politician speaking in such convoluted ways today? The problem, he said, was that the the country had failed to reinvent its national culture and its identity after empire. And with union in Europe growing, he said, the defining political question of the age would be, what sort of people do we think we are? And I wonder if part of what was going on throughout Brexit was people asking that question, but not quite finding an answer for it yet. Powell thought that the country was trapped in a fantasy of its own global significance, one that distracted us from taking a good look at ourselves. In our imagination, he said, the vanishing last vestiges of empire had transformed themselves into a peacekeeping role on which the sun never sets, whereby God's good providence and in partnership with the United States, we keep the peace of the world and rush hither and thither, containing communism, putting out brush fires and coping with subversion. It is difficult to describe this vision, he said, without using terms from psychiatry, a nation having so few points of contact with reality. 
So Powellism was hostile to that active engagement in the world, thought it was a delusion of the country. The cure, he felt, lay in renewed national self-knowledge. Not being afraid of the charge of little Englandism, he said, not afraid of the suggestion that one might become just a Sweden or a Switzerland. A healthy, self-confident, self-knowing nation, he said, no more keeps telling itself it is great or asking how great it is than a healthy person keeps taking his temperature. The very inquiry is a symptom of the disease. I think that power light attitude is quite a powerful influence on the present. The sense that the country doesn't know what it stands for anymore, isn't quite the way it was, that we should just leave everyone alone, stop bothering with all that stuff and work out who we are and look after ourselves alone. Thing is, though, I don't think that view is now one about Britain. I think that view is now one about England. Because also what's going on here, and it might seem perverse to talk about it in discussion about our international relations, is the reformulation of relations between the nations in the UK. We might see a future in which international relations are between England and Scotland and the whole of Ireland. Because what's going on, I think, is the shaping of a new kind of Englishness. Some idea of Englishness or contested ideas of Englishness are clearly an important part of our contemporary politics and they're very linked to the ways in which people imagine the place of England as an economic power, as a cultural force, as a military force in the world. Now that might be, in the long run, okay. Maybe we need to work that out and answer that kind of question. But here's my concern. Always within that kind of power light way of thinking, that conception of nation is completely connected to ideas about race. And that's why the immigration question is so entwined in complicated ways with everything about Brexit and about post-Brexit. Now, what we see in the US at the moment, under Trump, and particularly his key advisor, Steve Bannon, is an emerging political position that defines itself in international racial and religious terms, that sees foreign policy as shaped not just by economic interests or security interests, but by the need of white Christian people to defend themselves from the uncivilised hordes outside. And there's a possibility that parts of England might want to align themselves with that policy. From my point of view, whatever we might think about where we're going post-Brexit, we're going to have to deal with a coming hardening of divisions between people on the basis of race, and we're going to have to know where we stand on that. Thank you. <laughs>